welcome to Ideas of India, where we examine the academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Today, my guest is Karthik Murlitharan. He is the Tata Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California, San Diego. And he's the author of the recent book, Accelerating India's Development, a state-led roadmap for effective governance. We talked about the lacking state capacity in India, about improving the quality of public expenditure, fiscal federalism, methods to improve the hiring processes for government, and better ways of staffing and using the Indian bureaucracy, randomized control trials and development, and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit mercators.org slash podcast. I feel like I studied for a field exam on, let's call the field, the state of the Indian state or something like that. And it, it's incredible what you've done. So, you know, just so let me back up. For those who haven't read the book, the book is called Accelerating India's Development, a state-led roadmap for effective governance, right? So that's just the title of the book. And the core message of the book is that contrary to popular opinion, sort of the Indian state is not as large as it tends to loom. It's actually a very chronically under-resourced, understaffed enterprise. And what you look at is mainly problems of service delivery, but you know, uh, some things in addition to service delivery, like data management, personnel, and so on. And you try and find all the research that can inform us about how this can be streamlined. And because you're an economist, how it can be incentive aligned. And your goal is actually really straightforward, but also sort of really ambitious. The goal is that the state should be able to deliver essential services to every single Indian. Efficiently, you know, optimizing the tax rupees without any leakages and so on. And the streamlining that you look for in the book, I mean, this is the part that I found quite extraordinary, actually. It's in the areas of health, nutrition, education, staffing, personal management, policing, judiciary. I'm sure I'm missing a few out because it's got 18 chapters. And then you come up with recommendations and solutions. So what I felt was it's really sort of like a capsule Right. If 200 years down the line, someone comes and finds this book, you know, in a in sort of a time capsule, it's the capsule of the state of the Indian state today and sort of the best research we've had, say, in the last 30, 40 years on what the state is. So first up, I recommend everyone reads the book. And that's also why I sound so excited about it. Uh, you know, it's a gift to researchers, to be honest, because it's just I mean, it's so much research just condensed into what I call a capsule, except the capsule is very large and it is a bitter pill to swallow for many. So that's sort of how I felt about the book. <laughs> You're smiling. Yeah. No, no, I'm just listening. I'm just absorbing. You know, I think, listen, the core reason for writing this book, right, is that the motivation for my research and all the work I've done in 25, 30 years, right, mean, has been to kind of see how research can inform better policy making, better governance, because you see that at the end of the day, the state is the entity with the largest ability to shape you know, the lives of the poor, the common good, both by doing too much and by doing too less, right? So I think if I was to kind of abstract away and saying, what is the single most important message of the book? I think you get most of it. But there's a, a the, I think a one sentence way to say this is that we spend most of our public discourse and debate focusing on what should the government do and remarkably little on how should it do it or whether it even can do it, right? I mean, and so I think... Mm, I would say the more, so the, the, and that's why this is really two books in one. Okay. So the one thing which I've struggled with and, you know, and I still have mixed feelings about is whether there should have been two volumes. Okay. Like, I mean, where you have the first half of the book is really building an effective state. And the second half is accelerating India's development. And the logic is really, I do believe, and this is consistent with what multiple other commentators in the Indian economy have said, is that the binding constraint to India's development in almost every way is the effectiveness of the state itself. Right. So the 91 reforms, um, and, you know, I cite the 91 project, like, you know, the website. Uh, I was you know, thrilled the to see that. The, 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 you know, 
the 91 reforms was incredibly important, but it was really about getting the state out of the way, out of the way of things that it should not be doing. But the second part of the agenda, which is making a state capable of doing what it should be doing, right, I mean, is where we have to kind of now do the heavy lifting. And this is not an easy task, right? I mean, like, you know, people have famously said building effective states is like the slow boring of hard boards. And it's taken high income countries 100 years to do this. And my goal in this book is if we can compress India's cycle of building an effective state from 100 years to 25 years, like, you know, I mean, then I would consider my job to have been done. Um, And I think that's why the book is ambitious. But if I may, you know, if I may just, uh, you know, say something to your readers, which hopefully you can confirm, is it's a very, very easy read, right? I mean, (laughs) oh, it's a very accessible read. Actually, that's the reason it's a gift that you've done the heavy lifting of reading all these dense research, you know, sort of papers and RCTs. Actually, you've read everything from really tough papers to randomized control trials that you've conducted to blog posts to like little bits of classifieds in newspaper columns to our online project, which is the 91 Pro. I mean, it really covers the gamut. So I encourage everyone to read it, irrespective of whether they have any background in political science or economics, if they just want to understand the surroundings better on why certain things are broken and what works and why it doesn't work. Yeah. So, you know, and I think this, so the core theme, right, I mean, going back to just wrapping up the thing. So, you know, it's about that we, we talk about what to do and not enough about how to do it, right? I think that's one key point of departure, which is why the building the effective state is almost the first half of the book, right? But I think the other key unifying theme is simply in one sentence is that it really is about the quality of expenditure, right? I mean, so all of our public discourse focuses on what I call the top line of budget allocation and not the bottom line of how that budget translates into outcomes, right? So in a way, the intellectual thread that connects the whole book is when I look at what's the pattern emerging out of my own studies and other studies in multiple sectors. So I started my work in education, then started working in health, then did a bunch of work in welfare programs. And you see that the common thread across everything is kind of the weak governance itself and that the returns to investing in governance and state capacity are often 10 times more than kind of the business as usual spending on the top line, right? So, uh, but that's a very difficult transition to make because the top line is what you observe and that's where the conversation is. Whereas what the research has been about over the past 20 years has been in sector after sector, tracking the fund flows, looking at how does the spending translate into impact. And that's kind of why the book is, I mean, though it's been an insane amount of work, it's also been so much fun, right? Because there is so much you learn over the years through all of this that never makes its way into an academic paper. So the time to write a book in a scholar's career is when you feel that you have something to say that is kind of not being said in those papers and connecting the dots. So it has been an overwhelmingly like... Uh, all-consuming project, but hopefully, like, you know, hopefully the output is worth it. I want to start with what you just talked about, which is the quality of public expenditure, right? And this is in part one of the book. Uh, There's a big discussion on public finance. You talk about expenditure, revenue, federalism, and, you know, you sort of parse out all the different problems. In the book, you argue that to improve the quality of public expenditure, we need to focus on things like calculating ROI, which is the return on investment, considering sort of the second order effects of public spending, like, you know, if we spend too much on fertilizer, or free electricity, what that does to groundwater. You know, how do we boost both equity and efficiency? Because India is in that weird quadrant in your two by two where both can actually be improved without it being an explicit trade-off. You talk about more data-driven budgeting. You talk about more monitoring. But you also address that expenditures too centralized. And basically, all your fixes, the way I read them, were about streamlining the current system as it is, right? But when I sort of take one step back, when I finish reading those chapters, I think it's like chapter six, seven, eight of the book, and then again, a discussion towards the end where you reimagine the the Indian state. To me, the question is, isn't the core problem of public finance in India that politicians and bureaucrats aren't directly accountable to taxpayers, that link is too weak because it's too centralized and we gather revenue in the most bizarre fashion, relying heavily on consumption taxes, virtually zero on local taxes or property taxes and the spending almost entirely is controlled top-down. In fact, it's, it's sort of delegated even when the state is doing the spending. So, My sense was one way to fix the problem is the way you look at it, which is, okay, these are the six different areas. Let's find a fix to streamline each of them. Alternatively, I would imagine, wouldn't dramatic fiscal federalism just take care of this problem? Because that's a different kind of imagination. Then you don't have to fix 
each of these things. So, you know, maybe first you can walk us through how you see the problem and the solutions. And I know, because I know you, I know you have thoughts on deep thoughts on public finance and fiscal federalism because you've taught some of this stuff. So, you know, maybe you can make this a two-parter. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, you know, so let's start exactly with the first part, right? Because I think there's a lot of ideas there in Chapter 6 on the quality of expenditure, which itself, like, I think are worth expanding. And even before that, let me say, let me preface that a little bit more for your listeners, which is something, you know, which I think is really important. See, when we think of waste of public money, the first thing that most listeners think about is corruption, okay? Because we hear about scandals, there's scandals everywhere, and you think, okay, that's where there's inefficiency. But I think what some of some really high quality research on kind of government waste shows is that you know, maybe only about 17 to 20 percent of the waste is what is kind of active waste or corruption. And the vast majority is just inefficiency or passive waste. Okay, And I think this reflects the fact that regardless of what level of government you're at, I mean that because it's always easy to waste other people's money. Okay, And so there is there is just so much low hanging fruit in terms of improving efficiencies. And that's kind of why I think, uh, you know, that, that, that we can do a lot. Right. So let me also take, you know, two further steps back and come back. See, going back to this initial point about about focusing on quality of expenditure. One thing I want to highlight is that the big debates in development tend to be, you know, the growth versus development debates, right? Which in India has been like the Bhagavati versus Sen debates where the growth people will say, let's get the infrastructure, let's get the capex, let's kind of reduce the logistics costs and let's get industry growing, right? And the development people led prominently by Sen would say that, you know, the point of development is not just GDP per capita, the point is really human development. And so can we get more in health, more in education? And, you know, at one level, they're both right, right? because more growth gives you more human development and more human development will give you more growth. So that fight effectively becomes a bit of an ideological fight where the center right wants kind of the capex and the center left wants a social sector. So I think the reason I'm giving you this backdrop is like another core goal of the book, frankly, is not just the technocratic aspect, but it's really to kind of build a broad national consensus of saying, listen, we argue so much about zero sum things, but there are things that we can do that are positive sum that can allow us to do more of everything. Okay. And so the point is that the quality of expenditure is so bad, regardless of whether you're spending on infrastructure or you're spending on social sector, that if you manage to focus on that, you can do more of everything, right? I mean, and so which is why my broad, you know, my hope is that the state capacity agenda, the effectiveness of public expenditure agenda is something that can unite both the left and the right, okay? Because doing it better will allow you to better kind of, you know, do the basic human development and services and improve the functioning of the state, which the left cares about, but it'll also kind of improve kind of value for money and build the foundations of long-term growth, which is what the right wants. Okay, So I think I, I, I want to give that preface by saying that there is a deeper non-technocratic and I would argue almost like meta-political reason, right? I mean, for focusing and, you know, given that everybody knows that we're argumentative Indians and we love debating, it's really about how do you find a way forward, right? Like I mean, yeah. through all of these vexing debates. And I think that's been like an undercurrent, both of my thinking as well as the writing. And hopefully like, you know, that comes across in, in every part that you read. Now, having said that. Now, let's go kind of into the details of public finance and expenditure. So for your listeners, I think one thing that's really, and you know, expanding on what you said, that it's not about India being at a sweet spot. It's about the variation in the kind of expenditure. Okay. So, and what I have is this very, like I said, normally I make fun of consultants and I don't like simple two by twos, but this is a case where I think the two by two really works. Okay. Where you have, you can, the so it's a simple conceptual framework, which in fact, you know, multiple senior people in government have written to me and saying how much they appreciate that simple picture. That it just having that lens in thinking about budgeting can be so powerful because that's not the way in which people think about it. And the two by two is very simple, right? That you've got one axis, which is equity and one axis, which is efficiency. And you have spending proposals or any reform proposals, some of which improve e- efficiency, but at the cost of equity. Okay. So one good example of that would be rationalizing the GST to move to a uniform GST. Okay. So that would significantly improve the efficiency of tax collection, but it may come at the cost of being regressive and therefore like, you know, may hurt equity. Okay. On the other hand, you've got say programs like, you know, like the PDS, right? I mean, which presumably improves equity and food security, but is inefficient for a variety of design reasons. Okay. Now, most of our public discourse happens in that quadrant two versus quadrant four, right? Should we do efficiency at the cost of equity or the other way around? Okay. But part, a big part of the book is to say that, listen, we've got so many large expenditure items that are in quad, in region three, which are bad for equity and bad for efficiency. Okay. And we have so much low hanging fruit of things that we could do that would improve equity and efficiency that we're not doing enough. So again, while reasonable people may disagree on the second and fourth quadrants, can we at 
least kind of, sh- you know, put some sunlight on these huge kind of uh, region three expenses and build a broad consensus to say, can we move from here? Like, I mean, you know, to R1. So I think that's, again, the framework in which like, you know, this is sitting. And I think another, since, you know, since we're economists and maybe this is the podcast I get to be the nerdiest on, right? Like, you know, I mean, is the, you know, is, is see, again, as, as a libertarian mercatus, you know, economist, right? I mean, it's almost axiomatic that we think that there's a trade-off between efficiency and equity, right? I mean, that Tom, one of Tom Sargent's like 12 principles of economics that he talks about in Berkeley is that there is a trade-off, okay? And the default in public finance is we think there's always a trade-off between equity and efficiency. And that's because to do equity, to do this redistributive policy, you need to raise taxes, which distorts work incentives. Um, you need to provide quote-unquote freebies, which may reduce incentives to work. And subtly, when I'm targeting benefits to the poor, I need to phase them out. And so that creates a very high marginal tax rate for the poor as you're earning more. Okay, so put together, it's almost seen as axiomatic that I cannot do welfare without hurting efficiency. But intellectually, what makes development economics so much fun is the fact that, you know, both at the individual level and the aggregate level, when you are close to a poverty trap, when you're close to subsistence, we've got a whole class of models that shows how you can have well-designed well-implemented interventions that can improve both equity and efficiency. We're not at the frontier yet, basically. And we are so far from that, right? And so I think, exactly. but, but, you know, but even when I teach graduate development economics, right, the first question in the first lecture I ask, which most students still struggle with, I say when I teach PhD development economics, is like, what makes development economics different from just doing applied micro in developing countries or what makes it different from doing growth economics, okay? And the key difference is in both cases, it is the idea of a poverty trap, right? I mean, at the level of both individuals and countries. And so the point, therefore, is because we are still a low middle income country and because we still have large amounts of poverty and large amounts of other market failures and frictions, that there is a space for well-designed interventions that can improve both equity and efficiency. And that's what gives us this free lunch, right? So a big point of this book is there is a free lunch. There is a free lunch, like, I mean, if we get more analytical about our expenditure and start allocating. And so coming back to, you know, things that are in quadrant three or region three, you know, so much of our expenditure is bad for both equity and efficiency, right? I mean, like, you know, free electricity for farmers, probably the single worst policy in the country in terms of just the being, you know, being, it's it's the most inequitable thing you could do. It's the most ridiculously regressive thing, right? Where roughly top 5% of landowners get 50% of the subsidies and it's bad for equity, it's bad for efficiency, it's, and it's bad everywhere. And the environment, right? The second and third order exactly, effects right? are horrific. I mean, you know, or kind of uh, reverting to the old pension schemes, okay? So again, you're benefiting kind of existing government employees. We have tons of research showing that unconditional pay increases have no impact on outcomes. And part of the problem in personnel is you pay incumbents too much and you don't hire enough. And so that goes back to your original point about the understaffed state. So anyway, so I think this is just laying the framework for saying that that chapter six is just kind of laying out this framework work for how should we think about quality of expenditure, right? I mean, so in the case of CapEx, you would think about what is the return on investment and think about that like any capital budgeting exercise. In the case of welfare, it's a little trickier because there isn't necessarily a direct return on investment. But there you can think about the quality of welfare expenditure along the axis of, say, targeting, right? I mean, the tar- axis of delivery and then distortions, right? I mean, so and then you see and what it's showing is a taxonomy of how we can do better on each of these things. And so then it lays out this framework for how you can improve quality of expenditure. So now, having said that, let me jump to your second part, right? I mean, which is why is the answer not just more decentralization, okay? Where there is a lot more kind of linkage at the local level, right? I mean, between just between services provided and accountability. So I would say there's at least three reasons. Now, clearly, I believe in more decentralization, right? I mean, and that's there in chapter eight on federalism and decentralization. Actually, but it's there in all the chapters, right? It's, it's, much it's everywhere it's, you're talking about how we need to not do everything at this tiny little elite group at the top that doesn't have eyes on the ground. Right. It it cuts through. Okay. But I think so. I think that, but there are three reasons why, you know, I'm not putting all my eggs in the decentralization basket. Right. I mean, so I think one way to think about the book is that, see, it is a menu of options, right? I mean, and so recognizing the political reality, right? I mean, that if I say this is the one silver bullet and then that doesn't happen, then effectively it's like, okay, this is this one trick pony and then this is politically not going to happen and therefore we will not make any progress, okay? And I find that deeply unsatisfying, right? I mean, and so I think part of 
the book is really, like I say this in the preface, right? The In the preface, I say, right, it reflects kind of a lifelong journey at the intersection of ethics, economics, and politics, right? I mean, where you've got an ethical kind of underpinning of what kind of society you want to build. And then, but that is constrained by the economics of saying, what are the resource envelopes within which I need to achieve this? And then the last part of the politics is saying, let's think about the distributional consequences of every idea seriously so that you can build broad coalitions to make things happen. So that it's a book that it's at, it's a combination of idealism and pragmatism. Okay, And so it's the pragmatism piece that then informs like, you know, my approach, right? Which is to say, see, we are not going to get from a 3% share of GDP spent at local this thing to 50% overnight, right? I mean, and so, and in fact, it's interesting, even the finance commissions over the years, when they did a gradualism, when they did 1% each, right, that stuck. But when they tried, when the 14th tried to jump from 32 to 42, it was too big. And which is why then you get a bunch of offsetting behavior, right? I mean, which is then suboptimal in other ways. So you got, you know, the, uh, the government of India increasing state shares, you got kind of an increase in cesses and surcharges that were outside. So because that 10% was too big a shift for the system to deal with. Okay, so I think at the end of the day, you know, we're 1.4 billion people, we've got more people than the entire Western Hemisphere, North America, South America, Central America put together. Okay, so which means that this is a slow moving aircraft carrier, it doesn't take violent turns, right? So you've got to pivot this like, you know, gently in the right direction. Okay, so while we are doing the decentralization piece, I think there is still, you know, so anyway, I'll give you three reasons. Okay, so the first is just the pragmatic reason, okay, that there is a, even the decentralization agenda needs an element of gradualism uh, for it to be sustainable. And I'll come back to thoughts on how we might do this. Okay, that's the pragmatic reason. I think th there is also a deep substantive reason, okay? And the deep substantive reason is, and I say this in chapter eight, right? It is not obvious that we need more decentralization in everything, okay? There are some areas where actually you need more centralization and the subtle point, and that's why I go into the conceptual framework of how does country size affect the quality of governance, correct? So there are areas where size is good because of economies of scale, of coordination externalities and a bunch of other things. And there are areas where kind of being small is good because you need to cater to diverse preferences and you need better local information and the ability to act on that. Okay, so broadly speaking, you know, functions of service delivery that require accountability over the frontline service providers, right? I mean, are better done at the local level. But functions like infrastructure, functions, you know, like, I mean, or even welfare, right, which gets very subtle, because as you have many more internal migrants, right? So the way to then think about and we can talk more about, you know, the seven schedule and things in that, right? In fact, since given your own interest in constitutional law and stuff, I'd love to talk about that. But so there's three answers, okay? The first is the pragmatic political reason that the decentralization agenda is going to be a gradual one and not kind of a shock therapy one. Okay, so there is no state of the world where I see that we're suddenly going to go from one equilibrium to the other. Okay, so, so putting all the eggs in that basket, I think would not be pragmatically wise. The second reason is that just practically by first principles of fiscal federalism, like certain functions do need to sit at higher levels, right? Like, I mean, we'll need coordination, including things like welfare. Okay. And then I think there's a third reason which contributes to that, which is that I think the history of more decentralized societies comes from more decentralized revenue. Okay. Like, I mean, so if you want to have authority, then if you are contributing with your money directly. Okay. So the US has had a much more stronger history of decentralization because the property tax regimes are much stronger. Okay. China is decentralized, but China, what people don't appreciate enough is how much of the basic services include user charges. Okay. People are actually paying for it. And so when you're paying locally, like, I mean, that gives you more local standard to say, I am paying, I want the control. Okay. Now, in any polity where the revenue is coming from a completely different place and the expenditures in a different place, how is that money going to get there, right? I mean, so that then gets mediated by a political process at a higher level of aggregation. So that's exactly what my problem is, that no matter how much you streamline, create data management systems, create monitoring, that's eventually where you have to, you know, reckon with that. But which is why, which is why I think my pragmatic view of how we will get more decentralization, okay, then connects to chapter seven, which is we, we will not get as much decentralization by clamoring for more devolution, because that is effectively... It is a local body saying, I want money, but it is somebody else's money. Okay. So the, the pragmatic way to get more decentralization is going to be to strengthen, say, property taxes. Okay. So there, and that's where I'm most optimistic about the decentralization agenda. Okay. Because if you go to chapter seven on revenue, see, we clearly need more revenue, but 
the focus in that chapter is not just on quantity of revenue, but the quality of revenue, right? So how do you get the, raise revenue in the least distorting ways? And I think economists, we all agree that property taxes is something that we should have more of, okay? So one way of doing this is that on the margin, the Indian state mo needs more revenue. And if that marginal revenue is being generated at the local government level, then you are automatically shifting the share of kind of local government control over expenditure, correct? So to me, that is a more promising way of pushing the decentralization agenda rather than saying, okay, I'm going to have some rules that devolve more money. So I'm not, they're not mutually exclusive, but I think on the margin, you're going to get more traction by focusing on revenue raising at the local level, which will then automatically create the local spending authority. So I think actually now that I've heard you, we're not that far apart because my interest is actually not decentralization. It's fiscal federalism. And I'll tell you what the difference is to me. And maybe I'm being nerdy and nitpicking. But to me, decentralization is basically the central authority has the power and it's willing to part with that power or devolve that power. But whenever it wants, it can get it back. Whereas genuine federalism means that there is more than one locus of power, which is the seven scheduled stuff that you were talking about, right? That, that, it, that there genuinely is more than one power center. And in fact, there should be three power centers, right? And this works out much better in places like the United States. In Switzerland, it works remarkably well. In India, we really still only, because, you know, I mean, you talk about this in the book, because of colonial legacies and central planning, the locus is very much at the, at the union level and not even at the state level to a large extent, right? So to that extent, we are very much aligned that I think what we need is not so much decentralization, we need more fiscal federalism. And the federalism has to be fiscal in nature, you have to raise your own revenue, both through property taxes and through user fees. Actually, I think the poor in India, and you know this better than anyone, actually end up paying a lot in user fees. It's just to private sector people because they have exited the system, as opposed to having a process within the state system that they can mediate their grievances and actually demand the services and, and, and so on. Uh, but you know, there's also room for other things, which is not exactly devolution through the finance commission, you know, 1% up and down. But something like when you're designing the GST, for instance, right? At the design level, you can say that these are consumption taxes. The consumption taxes are obviously based on people in a particular location. And that location is good or bad to the extent that it can attract people. And, and have like an economic engine of growth, which leads to more consumption. So why not at the design level, imagine a GST, which directly splits everything at maybe 15 to 20% at the local level, you know, another 30% at the state level, and then the remaining to the union government or something like that. Right now we have a split between union and state. So I feel like even there, as opposed to the kind of devolution we've experienced in the past, there is much more to be done at the design level itself, which again, like I, 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 it's not that I was disappointed when I was reading the book, but I was like, this is also part of the low hanging fruit, Karthik. Like this is very much part of that two by two matrix that you're talking about, right? You're not going to lose that much in efficiency if you have a single rate GST, which at the design level says 20% or 15% goes straight to the local government. Yeah, so again, I don't disagree with any of this, right? I think the, you know, so I think the challenge here is, so here's the irony, right? The irony is, this is, you know, we've got the opposite problem, hopefully, of what I say in the bureaucracy chapter, right? So there's this, the joke I talk about the two people at the restaurant, where the first one says the food here is terrible, and the second one says the portions are too small, right? Like, you know, so, yeah. uh, right? And which is the truth, the story of our bureaucracy. This is the right? Annie is Hall, both, right? Uh, exactly, right? So it's both that, the, it's both that, the, you know, like, you know, the state is too small, but the design is horrendous, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah, facing absolutely. the opposite. I'm facing the opposite problem. Like you know, yeah. so maybe this is a humble brag, but the opposite problem is people are saying, you know, the content is good. You should write more, and then it's like the book is so big. <laughs> No, no, no. I Okay, so I'll tell you my charitable answer to that and my slightly cheeky answer to that. Okay. I mean, of course, you're right. The book is already enormous. And there's only so much you can fit in it. And, and you know, so on, so forth. But my cheeky answer is, I felt at various points, you either held back because you thought this is politically too difficult to do, or because there isn't enough of a robust empirical literature on it because you are really keen on the empirical literature and sometimes that's where my disappointment kicked in because I was like 
Karthik is a fabulous theorist too. Like he knows this stuff. He knows this really well. I know that he knows this really well. Why isn't it there in the book? And I was like, that's probably because we haven't done big empirical studies. We haven't done the different state comparisons on which ones devolved more versus less, or you know, which states have better working finance commissions and so on. And that's why the focus is so much on streamlining because there you have evidence for that marginal rupee expenditure. Am I kind of on the right track? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Right. I mean. And I think that's exactly right. I think, see, and even with the decentralization chapter, see, you could see, you can almost like see the, you know, you will probably pick it up, right? I mean, it's not just that I'm summarizing research. You can almost see the joy I am feeling when I find a good study, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that then allows me to be more confident about the claim that I'm making, okay? Because, you know, I think the, the and, you know, we, we can talk later about like the macro and the micro, right? Like, you know, I think the macro is an incredibly powerful way of having the frameworks. But I think one of the things I've tried hard to do in the book is like discipline everything I'm saying, right? Like, you know, I mean, by kind of, is there good evidence on this? I want you to go a little (laughs) off script, actually. You know, I, I really, I feel like you're almost tying your hands too much as an economist. It's almost like if I can't back this perfectly with a gold standard study which was published well and done by credible people I'm not sure I'm going to venture into it you know very much so, so listen you know I think there is a course I mean and maybe once that this book is done like you know maybe they'll you know I know uh, Amit has said I should be writing like you know blogs and newsletters and stuff like that you know yeah. and there may be a course for a continued conversation that says listen we don't have the perfect evidence but based on my considered judgment like you know this is what I would do okay yeah, and we have lots of theory on it right which also economics is a fantastic provider of both theory and rigorous evidence. So, no, absolutely, right? And I think, see, listen, I mean, so I think in a way the book is already way more than what most economists would do because yes, I'm mentioning I agree. so even what I'm doing in like chapter 2 or 3 of these grand kind of narratives of, of the Indian state and stuff, right? I mean, that is taking well-founded micro evidence and then placing this in macro framework. So I think I'm already venturing beyond the comfort zone of like, you know, just a well-identified, I agree. Mi- you know, microeconomist. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the level of venturing which I felt was appropriate for what is, you know, it is in some ways, again, I think one of my discussions somewhere called it like a magnum opus, like, you know, I mean, because it is kind of my grand synthesis and part of my scholarly brand, if I may say so, like, I mean, is that that rigor, right? You know, so I think I, you know, there is this fine line between kind of, I, I'm not ruling this out. Maybe that's why we do the podcast, right? We do the yeah, podcast. Yeah, and also we do maybe, you know, things. the next book, right? Because there's a lot of work to be done through, say, comparative studies, case studies, which are not exactly in the same realm. So, you know, so let me move to another part which you talked about, which is on welfare expenditure, right? So if we go back, I mean, again, you've taught public finance, so you know the stuff. Like, I love the thumb rule that Vincent Ostrom gave us, which is you want the level of government to be only as large as the extent of the externality that it's trying to solve, right? So the larger the externality, the higher the level of government that should be equipped to solve it. And that's an excellent thumb rule for externalities, public goods, and so on. Why not also extend that thumb rule to something like welfare entitlements, right? So, for instance, one of the things that you talk about in the book, and this is in a fair amount of detail on on the expenditure and also in other chapters, is that in poorer regions, most of the expenditure gets captured in some way, even the stuff that's not leaking out, which is like the fertilizer subsidy, the electricity, the free electricity, water, so on. But most taxpayers at the local government level wouldn't want their local government to spend on fertilizer subsidies and free electricity. They would demand health and education and public sanitation and public goods and so on, right? But when the system is centralized, that gets broken. So here we have sort of a wealth of literature globally, right, on this. I know we don't have very, very rigorous studies on India, but we do have a wealth of literature globally, both in public finance, in political science. Plus, we have some very, very solid theory from folks like Vincent Ostrom or Richard Wagner and so on. So I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, even for welfare expenditure, why is that not an equally useful lens to look at? I understand it's not in the book, but what would be your way to think about that? That's a very good question. And I think, see, I mean, the answer is very simple. Okay, the answer is the fiscal federalism and you know, and this applies even to that earlier point you were making. See, I think the fiscal federalism framework is a very powerful framework, but it is a deeply conservative framework, okay, in the sense that so it's basic, it's fundamental existential flaw, okay, is that it wants to sequester revenue like I mean in narrow areas, which essentially kind of completely bypasses the question of kind of equity and distribution, okay? So 
and see, and again, coming back to the federalism chapter, right? The U.S. is this deeply conservative constitution because it it's a bottom up federalism where it is kind of the DNA of the entire society was kind of local communities solving their problems and then reluctant. Constantly giving some power to the federal government for defense because recognizing that there's economies of scale over there, right? I mean, so I think a lot of the fiscal federalism literature, right, kind of is therefore, and which is why the U.S. Constitution is wonderful in every way, except it doesn't really care about justice, right? Like you know, it's not even in its you know, in or at least distributive justice, it's not one you know, slavery is not a you know, the so and we talk about one of the reasons the Indian Constitution is then so over centralized is like reflects the fact that local elites were just not trusted, right? Like can mean for and even today right I mean so the moment the US tries to do like implement the Voting Rights Act you need federal enforcement right I mean it doesn't happen in local level so I think that is the original reason right I mean for why everything in the Indian structure is so much more centralized because the moment you care about equity and justice right I mean then there's both fiscal and social reasons for why that gets aggregated and I think which is why right I mean what I'm doing here is kind of saying being aware of that history right I mean and saying that therefore the practical way to get the level of decentralization we want, right? I mean, is that we are never going to get away from this problem of needing taxation at a higher level of government and kind of redistribution for our horizontal equity needs, okay? But like you said, that why are we doing the why are we doing the subsidies? Why are we doing this? Why are we not doing education? So I think within that larger fiscal and constitutional framework that we have, that this is a constitution origin story that tried to build in equity and justice into its original moment, okay, at least in intention, if not in practice, okay, and so that gives you these, there is no way, right, I mean to say, even today, right, when you think about horizontal devolution in the Finance Commission, Bihar would not be able to fund its education system, okay, like I mean without its central transfers. Now, it's true that it's massively inefficient and therefore there are ways to then make those transfers more efficient and so part of the thing I'm talking about in that chapter, for example, is to say, you know, you, the problem with centrally sponsored schemes, and this is getting increasingly difficult as the divergence across the country is growing, right? I mean, is that you have the logic of a centrally sponsored scheme is to make sure that every state has a certain baseline of spending. The problem is that the norms are often kind of benchmark for the more laggard parts of the country, and that doesn't work for like a Bihar, you know, for, uh, for, for a Kerala Tamil Nadu. So one way to do that is to kind of have sectorally tied but line item untied grants okay that says you as long as you spend on education because i do care that a certain amount of education is happening but then i'm um, you know so that's why even everything i'm saying about decentralization is what i call a nuanced decentralization right i mean that recognizes the unique additional objectives that the indian state is trying to do which frankly was just not part of the lexicon of when we think of switzerland when we think these are deeply decentralized societies to begin with that grudgingly gave up some power for defense okay so which is why the origin stories are different, right, than the Indian one. So I think my approach, I think, takes that path dependence as kind of given, and then saying, yeah. given given the path no, dependence, I understand right? That. I mean, how do we get towards a better place? Here, there are maybe a couple more follow-up questions. So I agree with you on the origin story. I would add one thing, though. I think a very big part of the Indian origin story is not just this focus on justice or equity, which, you know, we say was not there in, in, in many of the other origin stories. But I think there's a very big emphasis on uniformity. And I don't think that's gotten us anywhere, right? Because the attitude is we need uniformity between Kerala and Bihar. And we don't care. We're willing to trade off uniformity for agency. We're willing to trade off uniformity for some kind of efficiency, especially when it comes to, you know, how we spend the marginal tax rupee and so on. So I think our obsession with uniformity is what has landed us in this mess. Because you're absolutely right. There are many other ways of supplementing a particular region or a particular state which is lagging behind, right? And I mean, the United States, you have Pell Grants and federal subsidies and those sorts of things. In India, you can very easily imagine a direct transfer for education. You can imagine a voucher system. You can imagine just a direct central scheme which will in some way supplement schools that have better learning outcomes or PISA scores. I mean, you're the expert in this, right? There are like 50 different ways to figure out how to target that. But that's a second stage targeting issue. But you're right, in the first stage design issue, our original design is now so complicated that you're kind of stuck with that. And I understand that you're trying to maneuver and find some efficiencies within that. And somehow I, I, I feel so weird that between you and me, I'm the radical one, because I just don't think of myself as that radical person. 
but but clearly in this conversation that's true but you know you've taken that there is an existing indian state i don't want to burn everything to the ground and like you know start from scratch so given what we have let's you know make some changes here and there in manuva no, and, and there's a lot of merit in that right? i think the one place i want to slightly push back on is the sense that okay therefore this is an, you know this is only an incremental agenda that can only get us a little bit right i think part of the point it can get us a lot get us a depending lot. on which area we're looking at see the other thing that we should not overlook right is see part of this is again the chicken and egg of low state capacity right so when you i think one of the biggest chicken and eggs is like see we are a low income country right i mean and so state capacity itself requires a certain amount of fixed cost and investment right so in the original kind of period you don't have the capacity see even today let's take today okay like 70 years after independence 75 years after independence right so what happens is like i remember kp krishnan saying this okay right like he, when he was doing land right he, he was additional secretary land and he said something like technically land the central government has no there is no constitutional place for it it, it is a state level issue okay but he said every state level counterpart was delighted when there was a central scheme okay and that's because the state level bureaucracy doesn't have the capacity to kind of then think through the issues and so that is this delicate balance again right I mean and that is even worse from state to center now it is chicken and egg right it's chicken and egg in the sense that you don't decentralize because you say there's no capacity and you don't develop the capacity because why bother with capacity when there isn't the money okay but which is why again it has to happen slowly right i mean where you say okay here is and you know and we see this right i mean with enrega like you know you so panchayats have kind of now become more powerful because there is real there is real money that is flowing down that pipe and therefore that gives a certain amount of d- 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 discretion we're starting to see yeah so i think that's why it it's it's interesting right i mean i think my goals are often quite liberal but i'm very conservative in a burkean conservative sense right i mean in the sense of saying that this is a large complex ship and you when you try radical things it doesn't usually end well okay so we have to go slow and that, which is why even my ideas of bureaucratic reform every set of reforms will often saying like listen let's kind of grandfather what's already in but let's think about the margin and on the margin you can start kind of moving this 800 megaton aircraft carrier right like i mean in you know in a more productive direct here you know one of the things that keeps coming up is the bureaucracy this is there in a couple of chapters in detail but it's kind of there throughout the book again right education health everywhere it feels like half of india's development problem is an hr problem right <laughs> we need to make you the human resources czar of the indian state or something or at least whoever is that czar needs to like imbibe the ideas in this book i'm very keen to talk about personnel within the indian state because okay you and i might disagree on what is the role of the state right let's say that you know maybe we both agree that fertilizer subsidy is a bad idea but there might be some other area where you think a particular kind of welfare entitlement is a good idea and i may think it's a bad idea or vice versa but whatever the role of the state we know that we need to be able to staff it efficiently we need the best quality people at each level we need the least amount of mismatch or misallocation between the talent and the actual role and somehow we need to accomplish all of this at the least cost to the taxpayer given our ambition and not just make it a self-serving enterprise where the bureaucrats are like the elite english babus who are you know going to kind of be a level up above everyone else and you've made some fantastic suggestions in the book on how to create say competence based career recruitment and career progression how we can have practical training programs how we can have apprenticeship programs how we can have you know short term contracts how can we create an impaneled sort of pool of you know upsc and other state government exams where you've already you know managed to find the right people now why not just put them in a larger sort of fence or a pool and then people can hire out of it just like so many suggestions i don't even think i covered half of it so first question i have is just for those who haven't yet read the book how is it that we actually recruit and staff government officials in india right from the most elite civil services to like the you know sort of ward and branch officer if you can just give us the cliff notes versions for the listener and then you know you can talk about some of the fixes and ideas because i think those are some of the places where i feel like we're going to get the maximum bang for the buck from your research right that's not a 2x 3x marginal change it's like a 100x change because it can dramatically transform how a ward functions or how a you know primary care health center functions and so on so 
again, this is a two part. Sorry, my questions are so long, Karthik, but the book is so long. So yeah, so again, a two parter, and now I'll I'll I'll, I'll you. leave you. So I, in fact, I really think of like the chapter five, the personal chapter, is one of my favorite chapters in the sense that I think it's not just be- it's not just because it's got a lot of research. I think that's perhaps the chapter with the most counterintuitive set of insights. Like you know, for a lot of people who don't get into the inner the innards of the Indian state, right? I mean, so and there is just so much basic misconception, right? Including the sense that oh, we pay too less and the state is bloated, when it's exactly the opposite, right? I mean, so anyway, so I think the factual question is is the easy one, right? The factual question is that for most government jobs, we select by exams, right? I mean, and this reflects kind of the sense that you know people need that the process needs to be objective and fair, and that exams were how mandarins were selected over the years, and we've just maintained that system. And I think over time, see, I think yeah, so it's a and that's why I there's so much to discuss in personnel, which is why I broke it into two chapters, right? I mean, there's the chapter on bureaucracy, which kind of just describes certain structural issues of the bureaucracy overall, and ends on saying what are the political actions that need to be taken for state capacity and then the personal chapter gets into the weeds of ideas that can be implemented by bureaucratic leadership themselves okay so there is so much low hanging fruit now before i get there i think see the other thing i want to highlight is that the book is also in some ways it's an ode to research right i mean because we have learned so much in the past two decades right so um, the quality of empirical analysis of personnel policies we didn't know much of this stuff before right i mean so the bloom and van rienen agenda on kind of measuring Measuring management practices of getting into the black box of what is the A that you put in the production function, right? I mean, what Solo famously called the solo the solo residual was a measure of our ignorance. Okay, and you can see that part of the management research agenda is saying, can we get into that black box of our ignorance and start putting some structure so that there are things we can actually work on? Okay, so so one of the very robust results from that management literature is that the by far the most important. So you know, they they measure management in very systematic ways. They do this for Um, you know, operations management, personnel management. I think there are other dimensions, but it turns out that personnel management is by far the most important driver, okay, of organizational effectiveness. Okay, so that's fact number one. Fact number two is that personnel management in the public sector is like. Standard deviations worse, okay? Like I mean, than in the private sector, okay? So, and then once you put that together, that kind of says, okay, this is hugely important for us to work on. So the answer to your first question is just that we recruit with an exam. But let me go a little bit more than that and just explain why the status quo is kind of dysfunctional, okay? Like I mean, and so so the dysfunction of the status quo comes from the fact that because government jobs are so lucrative, okay, both so at the very very high end, okay, for the very top IAS officers, you are being underpaid relative to the scale of your responsibility and what that talent would command in the private sector okay but once you go one level below the top essentially the public it's sector 7.2x 6x for teachers it's bananas so the public sector multiplier is just in, insane okay which is why you got to see that figure to believe it right and the reason this is so important and I'll come back to you know so because it matters not just for the state it matters for the overall economy okay like i mean and the broader distortion of talent that that creates and that kind of then feeds into the education and the skills and the jobs and all of those chapters right so that's why so the reason i didn't break this book into two volumes is because everything is connected to everything right i mean and so those cross connections is what kind of makes the whole thing an intellectual enterprise that you know you know that i've enjoyed doing so but coming back to the core issues of personnel okay so the basic problem of the indian state is that you pay too much and you hire too little okay um now so, so people might think that wait if i'm paying well do i maybe at least get good talent okay and that's where i think the research becomes important because it turns out that actually paying too much is in is incredibly perverse and can hurt public welfare right i mean and so and there's many reasons okay the first is just that when i pay too much i can't hire enough okay so that's just the basic reason okay and which is why you know and we've got studies now showing that unconditional doubling of pay okay of incumbent government teachers uh, that was in indonesia but i'm sure we'd find the same in india had zero impact okay whereas kind of high you know even modest amounts of pay linked to performance or even just hiring more staff okay like i mean but that same money gets you significant improvement so first challenge is just that your core problem of state capacity is you don't have the money to hire enough because your incumbents have taken all the money in these pay commission increases but it's more perverse than that right it's more perverse than that because the government is by far the most lucrative employer in town you end up with this kind of spectacle of you know hundreds of not multiple hundreds of thousands of applicants for every government job okay and that then creates a whole bunch of downstream 
staffing problem. So everybody looks at this and saying, oh, this says that the private sector is not creating enough jobs. No, it's not about the private sector jobs. The private sector is creating market clearing conditions. It's the government that's distorting the market. Okay. So, and that is, I think, one of the simple aha moments, okay, where, you know, the connection between the perverse, the structure of the public sector labor markets and the inefficiency in the overall gen. So these general equilibrium effects is not something that people have actually thought about or you know, analyzed enough, but it creates so many problems, right? Because what you have is you have candidates taking government job exams and every, because it's like a lottery, right? Your chance of winning this lottery ticket is like, you know, one in 300, one in 400. So it's, it's rational for the individuals to take as many. I think there was a print article that Shekhar Gupta tweeted just yesterday, like, you know, saying this guy who's been taking exams till his mid 40s. And, you know, and so it's a tragedy both for the candidates, but it's also a tragedy for the government. Okay. Because what happens is then the people who are getting into a job often have no interest in that job itself, right? You're only there because it's a government job. And, you know, people are attempting everything from being a forest guard to a teacher to a railway clerk. And it just doesn't matter. It is, do I get a government job? Okay. And so the cost of that is you've then got a huge mismatch between what people are intrinsically interested in and the job you're hiring them for a lifetime. So from a see, from a citizen welfare perspective, we have designed the worst possible system because people put in all the work before you join. And the day you join, you have lifetime employment, at which point you're set for life. Okay, so it is so it's perverse from a selection perspective. It's perverse from an accountability perspective. It's perverse from a corruption perspective, because, you know, when you, when the stakes are so high, it is kind of not surprising that you have a whole bunch of these recruiting scams because it's too lucrative, right? I mean, so and then so in a so and then you combine with lifetime employment, then you've got kind of this mismatch between skills and jobs. And you've got this general equilibrium problem of the entire labor market. Okay, so because remember, so why do we have an education system? that produces rote learning and produces exam taking skills and why do we have 80% of our graduates who are essentially unemployable in the private sector that's because the most lucrative employer in the economy cares only about exams and not skills okay so it is the so that is the downstream demand that shapes the upstream kind of education system itself and the entire labor market especially for the tertiary sector so everything, right? I mean, so today, like, you know, I've talked to people who run skilling and, you know, people drop out of skilling courses because it's too hard. So it's like, it's not that the private sector is not creating good jobs. The private sector is creating market condition jobs and the government has distorted the labor market by creating these completely like, you know, lucrative jobs. And so then the whole, the entire ecosystem, I think there's a stunning number from the study in Tamil Nadu by Kunal Mangal, right? They estimated that over 80%. Yeah, he's been on the podcast. Yeah. Over 80% of the unemployment of among educated youth in, in Tamil Nadu, like, I mean, is kind of attempting government exams. I saw a recent link, LinkedIn profile of somebody who literally on his LinkedIn profile said for 10 years, 10 years, the status was UPSC aspirant. So we've set up this incredibly perverse system that's not serving the state, it's not serving the candidates, and it is not serving the economy, right? Like, I mean, so, and so why are we doing this, right? I mean, and so this is why I'm saying that in a counterintuitive way, reducing the stakes of the government job lottery will actually be better, right? I mean, on multiple dimensions. And this is why it's so counterintuitive, right? So, you know, you'll get people kind of, and it's a little naive to say, oh, people should not be aspiring for UPSC, they should be doing other things. I mean, you're starting to see some of the public discourse emerge around, you know, the UPSC structure. But I don't think anybody's actually like, you know, put it together. Like, I mean, of how all of these pieces kind of come together, right? Like, I mean, so if there's, so like you said, what I'll also tell the readers is each chapter is like a mini book. Okay. So you just have to read 30 pages at a time and you don't have to read like all 600 pages, but just the chapter three will then give you the sense of here are the problems and now how do you fix it? Okay. And then you wanted me to talk about, you know, so, you know, before we get to the fix, I think there are also like second and third order effects, some of which you hint at, but, you know, we didn't talk about here. So they also clog up the education system, right? Because you need certain minimum qualifications. And also, you know, this was my experience when I was at Delhi University at the Faculty of Law getting a law degree. A lot of the people will enroll in LLB because even though they have no interest in becoming a lawyer, because, you know, it will count towards one paper in the UPSC exam. And if they can't clear UPSC, they can join the judicial service or something like that. And if none of those get cleared, at least at the end of it, you have something to show for it. You can go back to Bihar or UP or Rajasthan with a law degree so that, you know, your parents don't think this was a complete waste. So we also have this bizarre second order effect where 
I mean, Delhi University should be producing lawyers or at least people who wish to be lawyers, not just handing out LLB degrees to anyone, you know, who needs to do this as a byproduct of writing exams or, you know, something else. A lot of the MA MPhil courses in India are exactly clogged up for this reason. A lot of the teacher training requires additional degrees or, you know, a, a master's degree or an education degree. And and just to get that hike in pay or to qualify for that promotion, people are just clogging up the state education system in this bizarre way. So, you know, that's like the second, I don't even know if this is a second order effect or a third order effect. It's It just, like you say, when it causes distortions, it's so big, that distortion. Yeah, and I think, you know, so see, frankly, I'm not bothered about the fact that they're in an education program while taking the exam. Okay, that's fine. What bothers me is that there is no real skill being accumulated in that period other than kind of just taking exams. Okay, so, you know, which is why it's not like me. So, and so let me, you know, maybe just talk about kind of some of one of these solution ideas or two of these solution ideas, right? Like, I mean, and seeing how do we kind of, you know, it is a Gordian knot, okay? Like, I mean, it is a wicked problem, right? So you can't, because the problem is you can't say, oh, we're paying too much, we're going to reduce pay. Okay, that's a political non-starter, okay? You can't say that I've got a long left tail of people with lifetime employment who are not upgrading the skills and who are not working. That's a political non-starter, okay? So, which is why you kind of got to combine this with the art of the possible and saying on the margin, right? I mean, so every new cohort is kind of where you kind of can actually change this, right? Now, for the incumbents, you can do some things like I'm talking, you know, and I think even though my own work has shown that performance-based pay can be highly effective, I'm also, you know, realistic that that's very, that's a proof of concept study that shows how much slack there is in your day that you can get so much. But in practice, implementing that in government is next to impossible at scale because of the measurement challenge, okay? But you can at least do kind of competency-based kind of uh, promotions because that's fully in your control, okay? So you can, and this is what, to be fair and give it credit, that's what Mission Karmi Yogi, I think, is trying to do and eventually heading down that path of saying, that let us create these competency passbooks for every government employee so that there's a set of skills, that there's continuous education, there's upgrading, and let's at least do that. But I think coming back to two or three of my, you know, important reform ideas, I think the, yeah, one is the practicum, okay? And I think the practicum is one of these kind of, I would say it's perhaps the most important idea in the book, okay, in terms of how it cuts across so many sectors. And it it, it channels a body of research, okay, that says you can have locally hired contract teachers who are paid one tenth of the government teacher and who are as effective, if not more effective. Okay, so this is what multiple studies show. Okay, but here's the problem. The problem when you try to quote unquote, you know, just scale that up, which some states tried, it gets into three difficulties. Okay, so the first is the professional difficulty, which is the apex certification institution, say in education, like a NEPA or an NCRT, like, you know, who are kind of the apex, they absolutely viscerally detest the idea, okay, that you would deprofessionalize education and get in a bunch of people with no teacher training, okay, which means it's dead on arrival, okay, because whatever the economists may say, those are the bodies that are institutionally like can he have a seat at the table every time these policies are made okay and remember the secretaries come and go every two years okay but these guys are there forever okay so that you you cannot win without kind of co-opting and kind of working with those institutions okay so that's problem number one Problem number two is what you would say is, is the is the legal problem, okay? Because you kind of tried to do this. And so the problem, the mistake was even with, say, Shiksha Karmis in Madhya Pradesh is that then governments tried to do this in the cheap, okay? They said, okay, we will not hire regular teachers and we'll keep hiring these kind of informal teachers. And then you kind of, it's unsustainable because you go to courts and saying it's equal pay for equal work. We're side by side doing the same job. Like, I mean, why should I not get regularized? And one fine day, the court will pass an order and then you got retrospectively, then, you know, you like you have a problem. And the third is the political problem, right? Which is you you've got the pressure cooker building up of these kind of contractual workers and no politician can resist then at the time of election to say that we are going to regularize you. And then you get the worst of both worlds because you don't even have the qualifications of the exams and you've gotten regularized. Okay. So, which is why, like, I mean, the, the approach I'm proposing is to say, listen, as a professional educator, as a professor, I believe in training. Okay. It's not like I think credentials don't matter. It's just that the nature of our credentialing, right? I mean, why does all the research show that having a teacher training qualification has no impact on your effectiveness in the classroom, okay? Um, one simple reason is that many of these degrees are fake, okay? So if they're fake, then obviously it doesn't matter. <laughs> They've never seen the a classroom <laughs> during the training. The second one is even when it is not fake, even when it's genuine, 
a lot of the training focuses on history, theory, philosophy, sociology of education, as opposed to kind of the practical aspects of teaching and managing a classroom. Okay, so and then there's obviously aspects of incentives, accountability, etc. Um, so, but the long story short is that. Training is good. Training does matter. But what the global evidence suggests is that for service delivery functions, the most effective training comes on the job. Okay, like it comes from doing it and ideally doing it under the eye of somebody with more experience who you can just constantly turn to. Right. Like, so, so what I'm proposing is a very, very, very simple modification of saying, let us not think about this as changing public sector recruitment. Okay. Let us think about this fundamentally as changing skilling in human capital. Okay. Because when you think about the future of jobs in a world of automation and AI, right? I mean, where are the non- automatable jobs. They are in service intensive areas that are physical, that require kind of the human judgment, the situational awareness in the classroom with the patient, with in a law and order situation, in a conflict situation, right? So those are the places where it's not just about jobs. Think about where does human intermediation add social value, okay? And it's going to come in those service sectors. And so if you're skilling, if you think about this agenda, as it's an agenda of skilling for the service sectors, that is going to help both the government government and the private sector, okay, because these are all jobs where the private sector employs four times as many as the government, okay. So, if you say that tomorrow, like, we're going to launch this kind of practicum-based credentialing programs, where after 12th standard, like, you know, in many cases, you just say, we'll take the top candidates in every panchayat, like, I mean, bring you to the district headquarters for three months of modular training, and then there is nine months of practical training that happens in your home village, where you are just posted in your school as an apprentice, okay, and you do this for a maximum of four years. Right. So then at the end of the four years, you have gotten a degree. It is a degree. It is a credential with much better actual human capital because it's you've learned on the job. OK. And what you're doing is you're paying a stipend, which is much lower than the pay. But that is tenable in every way, because even legally, like, I mean, this is now ring fenced within your training and capped at four years. It's not like you can be exploited for 10 years, like, I mean, on that arrangement, it's part of that training. And then the key point is to say at the time of regular recruitment for government jobs, you don't change that, but you provide extra points, okay, like, I mean, for every year that you've spent in a practicum. And so what that does is it's still the practicum doesn't guarantee you that job, okay, so there is still that exam based selection, but there is now weightage on actually having done this job. So As opposed to just mindlessly taking exams. Instead of mindlessly taking 25 exams, like I mean the person who is committed to a sector and has shown that commitment by kind of doing the practicum based training has a significant advantage in the recruitment process. And then finally, we even with this, there's not going to be enough government jobs, okay, for everybody. So the key point is that these are all sectors that also have large private sector scope, okay. So then what you're doing is you're working with the private sector to kind of get this credential recognized so that it is then, it is not seen as a hiring program. It is fundamentally a skilling program, but where the apprenticeship and practical training is happening in the context of public facilities, and that allows you this win-win-win of saying, how do I augment state capacity and staffing at a fiscally affordable way, in a way that is also boosting training. And in a way, if this practicum is local, I think this is a particularly big deal for young women. Okay, like when we think about female labor force participation, you know, study after study shows that, you know, you've now got in almost every state in India villages with high school pass women, like I mean, who would like to work, but for a variety of sociological, patriarchal and safety reasons, don't want to leave the village. Correct? Like I mean, so how do you create those jobs? I'll give you this stunning statistic, right? So Tamil Nadu, and I talk about this in the education chapter, right? So post-COVID, Tamil Nadu did this, probably one of the world's most ambitious COVID remediation programs, right? Where they hired 200,000 young women, like at a stipend, an honorarium of a thousand rupees a month to do 60 to 90 minutes of after-school training. So, and, you know, we showed that the program is highly effective, cost-effective, improved equity. But what is really stunning is that even in a stipend of a thousand rupees a month, you had four applicants per job. And this is Tamil Nadu. This is not even UP or Bihar. Okay. And then the qualitative interviews, when you go talk to these women, like what they're valuing the most is the ability to leave the house and the ability to have that income, have that income, have that respect, have that standing, right? Like, I mean, in the community that comes from then being that kind of local service provider, right? So that is such a win, win, win in terms of kind of 
the untapped human potential that we're sitting on it can mean that if just a little bit of creative unlocking right so and you know these women naturally have like very i mean they have excellent core skills because women in india are raised to have excellent core skills they can solve problems you know if the electricity goes away if there's a crisis in the school these women are basically fundamentally solid at doing that sort of thing right they're not going to be deer in headlights so I feel like that's another part of it but my favorite part of your practicum program is actually slightly different. So uh, this is a little bit off tangent but you know I was reading John Liss's book The Voltage Effect and how he talks about when you get excellent results in a pilot program or a randomized control trial and then you try to scale it you may not be able to scale because you'll have what he calls a voltage drop and this is a classic teacher training example right so when you do like a small little pilot in one particular district or one particular suburb of chicago you can hire the best school teachers but if you need to do this across the state of illinois ding 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 we are not training enough high quality teachers at a scale and at a quality that now you can actually deploy them across all the kindergartens in illinois and we're going to have the exact same problem in india so what i like the most about this program is how scalable it is not just from a fiscal point of view but because here you don't have those standard you know inelastic supply problems which you have virtually everywhere else and you may also have inelastic supply problems in other countries where you know the median age is 10 years or more than india like in the case of china or somewhere else but in india we're not going to have that problem so you're not going to get the voltage drop because it's literally happening at the lowest level where there's this massive elastic supply of labor with you know core skills may not may not be sophisticated skills but core skills so that's actually my favorite part of what you suggested though you haven't talked about that Yeah so but in a way what you're saying is you're bringing back the Lewis model here right like you know you're basically saying that there is kind of an infinite supply right like you know there's elastic supply because you've got this demographic but let me kind of also you know I'm glad you caught on to this right because this is something I do write about in some of my papers on on scaling right and I think the reason I feel particularly confident and this is not just about the practicum right we so the other kind of no brainer low hanging fruit which I would recommend that you know the government does the new government does the first thing literally when they come up is to literally hire a second anganwadi worker like i mean everywhere right i mean and that's because so it's the same kind of you know and again all of this is coming from high quality evidence right so we've got this large scale our city in fact just came out in the jpe in general political economy uh you know this 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 month and this is again 160 320 anganwadi centers four districts in tamil nadu 160 randomly selected to get this extra extra worker and you know you get this stunning improvement in learning outcomes but also a reduction in child nutrition malnutrition because the you freed up the time of the existing worker right to spend more time on health and nutrition and we estimate that the ROI on this is between 12 to 20 times the cost okay so that's a classic example of a quadrant 1 expenditure right that improves equity because the children who are benefiting are the most marginalized and has a 20x ROI like I mean, you know if you're a private investor and given that kind of opportunity you'll say where do i put more money but we're not doing it because all of the money is going to unconditional salary increases of the incumbents because that's your your public choice persona will be delighted to know that i agree with you that the political economy is like all the power is with the incumbents like you know who then grab the lion's share of the money but sorry but coming back to this point about voltage effect the reason i cite that study is because it exactly did what the scale up would look like which is on the extensive margin hire one extra person in every village and that labor supply existed and what the tamil nadu illam thedi kalvi shows is you could do that for 2 lakh women and they existed and there was 4x as many applicants at so here is the basic point right our public sector pay is so out of whack that at the current rate you get like 200 applicants per job okay you could reduce that wage by a fifth and still get 10 applicants per job okay like i mean and you will still get and i think the other subtle point which is underappreciated in kind of our distorted personal policies is you see yes if i offer a wage that's 10000 or 8000 as opposed to 40000 yes i'm going to get less qualified people but the problem in our system is we have obsessed on paper qualifications and the idea of getting quote and quote the most qualified person even though uh, they are not connected to the community right i mean so the person who's passing that test and and even if they are local once you're paying 40000 50000 their aspiration is to be urban and so where does the absenteeism problem comes from half of it comes from the fact that everybody is doing quote and quote up down like you know so people so here's the thing right when you talk about absence people say are but poor things the teachers live so far i'm like boss the endogenous question is 
is the where you live is a Why choice live so choice, where you live is a choice variable right like you know so that's not like something that is fixed so and and again we have evidence on all of this stuff right like you know so one of so in health one of the most effective interventions of the past 30 40 years has been the asha program right i mean and the core of the asha program which is what dr you know abhay bang and rani bang de- developed in gadchiroli in western maharashtra backward area tribal area and the whole point was that instead of saying that we want highly skilled doctors to come and relocate here how do you upskill people in the local community who are invested in the community and having that faith in the community because they have skin in the game okay and it and they saved us during covid when you couldn't have migration and when you you know had all these other problems i mean the asha workers are like the absolute heroes of india's covid outcome especially in the better districts so you know but but everywhere right but i think the point i want to make is not yeah of course you know when you have the capacity in times of crisis the capacity saves you right but the more systemic point is that the key there are two or three keys to that model right which is local talent right I mean invest in upskilling the local talent and a compensation system that is actually kind of a piece rate because you're kind of paid on institutional deliveries paid on vaccinations right like i mean so that gets to topics in chapter 12 about the dysfunction of the you know but anyway listen there's a lot going on here but i think this is one simple idea that then has applications in education applications in health applications in policing okay and which in fact may be one of the highest return areas okay where the same approach and you know think about you know sometimes i joke in saying the politically viable slogan and maybe there is some hindi speaking chief minister who's listening to this right is literally what i want is a teen deviyam program <laughs> i mean just like you know <laughs> So of course it was this famous Devana movie it. okay like you know the the Teen Deviyam program would basically just say that every village like you know or every habitation would then have kind of you know these practicum based apprentices in health in education and in police and you could even over 3 years or 4 years imagine giving them uniforms with like one stripe two stripe three stripes like you know that tells you which year in your program you are because again we have we are such a status conscious society that wants these little markers right like I mean so but these are ways of providing jobs of creating huge social value you and of and dignity. skilling our human capital building is not happening in school so it has to happen somewhere so you know and so and then you kind of paid forward right i mean because effectively the contract that the government is then signing with the 18 year olds is to say you know we are investing in you for you to invest in the children right like i mean and then what you're getting is this credential that is then going to be valuable both in the public and private labor markets and frankly for health you know you could imagine that there are kind of for the top candidates they might qualify then for the kind of credentialing that would be internationally valid okay and then where is the big global opportunity today like you know it's kind of in the caregiving jobs in aging societies right so that's a, so there is a global part of what india needs to negotiate you know kind of with with the west with the aging west right which is to say let's have high quality guest worker programs you don't want the migration because obviously there's political costs of migration but there's economic needs like i mean for kind of workers in the caregiving economy and yeah like you know there are like hundreds of thousands of jobs like i mean in the caregiving economy where if you can get the certification and the standards right and have a visitor a clear work visa program okay where like you know where you come back in 3 years right i mean so it's a 3 year 6 year kind of program but imagine in this practicum you're starting all the way like i mean at the bottom but as but there is there is prizes that in fact there might be a prize bigger than a government job okay because the bigger prize than the government job is to be so good that you get the foreign posting okay but that requires kind of being good enough that that entity that is going to credential you for providing those quality of say care services to the geriatric kind of population in Japan or Germany or the US that's going to be at an, such a high standard so what you've done is you built an aspirational career ladder whereby people are being rewarded for real skills as opposed to rewarded for exam taking which doesn't has zero returns in the labor market So anyway, so this is one of those I think truly kind of low and there's somebody very very senior in the government who said you know if we manage to do this one thing in the next five years you know this book would have served its purpose. No, I really love this idea so much and it has so much practical value and you know you can think about extending this right. So you've talked about anganwadi workers, you've talked about teachers apprentices, you've talked about police apprenticeship, but we can also think about this in the context of something like you know the the sorts of short uh, service contract programs. the government tried to start when it came to the armed services right now again that may not work well for someone who's at the frontier or someone who's going to be an air force pilot but there are so many other jobs at cantonments to be done right you need a health worker at the cantonment you need gardeners at the cantonment right you need so many other support services which right now is just simply out of question because the 
fiscally it's it's an impossibility right now i mean to to even suggest something like that no no and i'm so glad you said that right because i think see i, I my own view on agnivir is like you know it's 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 like about 80% right but loses it's about i would tweak it right because i think yeah i don't want this to be agnivir by the way i want it to be what you are suggesting exactly. as an extension into the armed forces so i think like you know where the model works it's i don't think the model works for fighting soldiers okay and it doesn't work for fighting soldiers for all three reasons right because i don't even think it's cost effective because the fixed cost of training somebody to bear arms is way 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 higher okay so then the, the skill level right the recruitment the training all of it exactly so i don't think it makes sense even economically frankly like you know in terms of the cost of the training so that's one the second is kind of at the end of the day like Uh, being asked to lay down your life okay is the ultimate sacrifice which people do not for often some abstract notion of country but for a concrete notion of my unit and like i mean my buddies okay so that kind of sense of solidarity in the fighting soldier like i mean i think is very precious and the last and i think what i worry the most frankly is like the military is about applying lethal force and there is no civilian use case we don't want to train people in that absolutely no civilian use case okay it like, can I mean for the ability to apply lethal force okay whereas for the but we've had this long tail to tooth to tail ratio right i mean for all of the support staff right the cooks the drivers the gardeners like you know i mean so there you could do this for four years and then it's a huge boost because then the discipline of having been in the army and having a skill that is needed in the real economy then gives you a boost back like you know out there so yeah no no the reason i didn't mention agni veer is absolutely like i don't i didn't say agni veer because i don't want it to be that but the army employs so many you know people who are loading and unloading in difficult containment areas people who are drivers of really heavy duty vehicles right people who are actually doing security for the containment people who are managing the supply chain of the containment the pantry i mean these are really detailed tasks i have been to army containments and it's like running a small city right they also have a school they have a temple they have so many things So, but the reason I mentioned it because that was the context in the military, right? Like you know. So, but I think we're completely aligned on that. Yeah, yeah. So, Agni Veer is uh, for me. I, I, I mean, I was actually nervous when they put that program out for all the reasons that you mentioned, especially the lethal force issue. I have, you know, one of my colleagues here at George Mason, Chris Coyne, has talked so much about how we've imported the wars that. the united states has conducted abroad we've imported that back home because a lot of the weapons come back and then they get deployed at these local sort of police chiefs and so on a lot of the veterans come back and then they work in the you know sort of policing units and veterans get an advantage and then you have this really big problem of police brutality and you know lethal force being used in the united states and all the downstream effects so i am you know forget everything else and the fiscal and all just on that exactly. lethal no, force no, exactly. issue so alone i'm totally with you i think we're fully yeah, yeah. aligned we're fully aligned but you know but i think but coming back to you know just bureaucracy personnel etc i mean i think the other thing which we which is different right i mean which is a this distinct idea see this approach of practicum i think works for frontline services in fact the one place which i thought you'd be excited is it, in fact it can also work with courts right where i have mentioned where here it's not a full time this thing but just saying let's give every district court the district apprenticeship judge, model yeah you know two legal clerks right? right like i mean and so that you hire through a state level exam so i think there was a madras high court or somebody said that 85% of law school degrees in india are worthless okay so then that again has the downstream effect of saying if because the government is the largest employer in town you can shape the entire ecosystem of the skilling economy by kind of recruiting for the right things okay saying i'm going to have an exam to recruit for legal clerks and then these clerks up it's a two year clerkship that you spend and it just kind of because it's not easy to augment judge capacity even if you have the fiscal allocation because where do you find the judge is correct so so that way this becomes a more practical way of augmenting judicial capacity for the research the writing the first drafts and all of that the way clerks work and then that's a two year thing and that also has i think many of these benefits right yeah i was less excited about that because you know some of our courts already have an informal clerkship program the, the supreme courts. court has not, a slightly more formal clerkship but yeah not in the district courts you're right yeah yeah no that i'm excited are, but about but 86% of cases are there right so again that i agree and we need to train people to be the next district court judge we need case management we have so many tasks yeah, i so mean so the district courts but remember my focus is on district courts right because again see elites focus Absolutely. on what's happening at the very very top but where the bulk of those cases are are sitting in the district courts right like you know, so and then anyway so i mean i think you also mentioned this empanelment so let me just talk about that quickly oh yeah so one sec so you know aside from this the empanelment so i am most excited about empanelment okay and i let you describe it first but i'll tell you which element of empanelment i'm excited about because when i was reading that part i was like this is the best thing i have read so far because 
so just briefly, the idea of empowerment is, you know, all these people are taking these UPSC and state service exams. We only manage to recruit like the top 0.1%, which is the cream. And then everyone else who took the exam, it's like a total waste. And now they're going to go back and spend some time studying. But there isn't that much difference in quality between the 0.1% and the top one or the top 2%, right? You can still use that. And the fact that these people have cleared that exam is now useless, right? Your All India rank is useless. Nobody cares. Cares. Private sector doesn't care. It doesn't turn into a credential. It doesn't turn into anything that can actually be leveraged outside of that exam. And what you suggest is we create a pool, we empanel them such that governments across the board can recruit contractors from that pool. And then again, they have the same point system and so on. So I'll let you describe the rest of it, but then I'll tell you what I'm excited about. Yeah. So, and again, again, see, it's just coming back to, which is why, you know, taking a step back about the book itself, right? The book, I think, I mean, what is unique about it is like, and the reason, again, this is just apologizing for the length is that every chapter is what I call half science and half engineering, right? So there's the first half, which is saying, here are the facts. Okay. Let's just understand the facts and the reasons. And now let's kind of build a better mousetrap. And so here, the core fact is that the state is hollowed out. Okay. We just don't have enough people in the state. So, and one measure of this is you go to any government office in state or center they are kind of strewn with consultants okay like i mean and it's these consultants like you know oh my god this is a nightmare in economic right? policy right now now and but the reason is that it is both a cause and a consequence of the atrophy of state capacity correct like i mean so if you are a secretary today and you need a document you need something you need a powerpoint made there's nobody in your office who can do it right i mean and so effectively like because you are under pressure you the consultants have many advantages okay like i mean they are accountable they are flexible and they have better skills okay all of that goes but the problem is that so there's at least three problems right the first is that they get used very tactically the second is the consultant is only as good as the rfp okay like so you can do what you're asked to do but you can't think for the government you can't think in the public interest and when you start doing that then we get into other murky territory and then the last problem is just the lack of institutional memory as people rotate out rotate out there's a project and then that is not the state so then you're actually further hollowing out the state because instead of investing in the capacity of your people because that's a long term project like I mean you can't so it's both a cause and a consequence correct like, I would add a fourth actually which is that a lot of the times the consultants get their next gig for agreeing with the state which is typically not the job of the people at the highest levels especially the thinking jobs and there should be people who give some kind of a feedback mechanism but to get the project you have to kind of say oh and even if they don't have to agree with the state there's this imagination that I, if I tell them what they want to hear if I please the client then it's good right which is exactly what's happening because they don't have the local standard to push back frankly right like you know I mean, yeah. because see absolutely because, because at the end of the day the government treats them as kind of vendors for hire like you've been asked to make this report you do the report and you go i want a nice flashy report that looks good that's essentially like you know and multiple officers have told me he said listen if i want a good flashy report that i can inaugurate these consultants will just crush it okay like and if they want something good then they have to ask karthik to write the report that's basically the gap right now no, no, but the problem is like you know you can't you can't scale me I mean, well, that's why I'm building sieges, but that's a different story, right? Like, you know, and we'll maybe talk about that some other time. But, but just coming back to this core problem, okay? The core problem is that we don't have enough. There just isn't enough capacity within the government. There isn't enough headcount, and there isn't enough skills, okay? And this is one thing we didn't talk about. The problem of the status quo is the problem of lifetime employment, okay? So, and that lifetime employment basically means that it is not just that you're wasting money on people with obsolete skills and no incentive to upgrade the skills. Often, even if you're willing to pay the salaries, their presence makes it harder to modernize, okay? And the best example I use of this is, say, the bank modernization. Like, you know, banks couldn't computerize because their existing staff, like, I mean, were just too kind of reluctant to do it. So, the only way the banks could do it was VRSing, right? Like, I mean, and getting kind of the vintage kind of carder out and getting in a new cohort of people who would... So, it's not just the salary, right? It is what you're doing in terms of slowing down the technology adoption within the largest player in the economy because of these kind of intra kind of org issues, okay? So, so, bottom line is consultants have huge, there is value, okay? There's flexibility, there's accountability, and there's current skills, okay? So, this is not taking... And fiscally, they are cheaper than the lifetime employment to whoever you hire. Exactly. Well, yeah. To you know, a large extent. But of course, it looks like governments are hiring consultants all the time. So, once you integrate over that, it's not obvious. But anyway, right? Like, you know, because the margins... You... Presumably, <laughs> it there, could be fiscally at flexibility. At least flexibility. Yeah, there's right? flexibility. Yeah. So, but I think, so the problem here is, but different kinds of lateral entry have been talked about, but that doesn't work. Eight, again, because 
there is a process and departments often lack kind of the fixed cost of paying for that. And then even if they do it, then you worry about irregularities. Okay. Like, I mean, are you hiring your friend, your nephew, you're saying, you know, so we are always nervous about kind of lack of transparency and due process in public sector hiring. Okay. So my idea is therefore very, very, very simple. Governments desperately need people. You need people who, and we have no shortage of people who want to serve in government. Okay. But our current public sector recruitment, I mean, think about it, right? With an acceptance rate of 0.1% or 02 percent and if the average student studies for two years and they often study for more the opportunity cost of every one person hired in government is over a thousand man years like you know or person years okay like a mean of time that people are spending studying for this exam okay so my simple idea is to say if instead of the top 0.1 percent you take the top one percent or two percent and you just empanel them and then you're saying okay once you are in the top one percent you've already shown that in raw smarts you are kind of in the pool that is at the very top and now let's give you a foundation course we'll give you a three-month foundation course that could be virtual with some field visit some interaction whatever and at the end of that foundation course which is certified by upsc and some combination of central training agencies you've got a pool of empaneled talent like i mean who then any government department anywhere in the country can just kind of appoint on a three to five year contract now and that department is capable and fully empowered of having its own additional requirements okay so now let's say i want to hire in the tax department so today like i mean upsc doesn't care what your major is okay but in the tax department i would love to have somebody who's got some accounting background some finance background some law background right like i mean in forests i would love somebody who studied botany and zoology right like i mean but today there is no matching at all right i mean between the course of study and your job and so now what you have is the exam see the main value of the exam is because of the shoddy and variable quality of our kind of degrees the exam serves as sort of like a gre sat type of common clearing ground to say, okay, this is a high integrity exam. And if you pass this, you are of a certain basic standard. Okay. So that purpose is still useful. But what it doesn't do is do anything in terms of getting the fit between your own training, your own application. Allocation of talent. So let us use the exam for what it's worth. But tweak where it is not working okay and so now yeah, so it's you, selection not allocation and then allocation can be done through other mechanisms exactly right so it is objective you're getting the objectivity right like i mean and you're getting kind of the transparency and you know and in a way and you're paying the fixed cost because it's a high fixed cost enterprise right like i mean so in fact one thing we did not talk about is one perverse thing people wonder is why are so many vacancies unfilled even though they are sanctioned programs. oh yes and that's my favorite part <laughs> And it's because nobody wants to run the recruitment process because the fixed cost of running the exam for an officer, there's only downside, it's right? Because crazy. if there's corruption, it's crazy. So why would you run the process? So which is why you choose to do it once in four years, once in five years, sporadically. And then politicians like doing that before the elections. And therefore, the nature of public sector jobs, instead of being about serving the public, it becomes about the benefit I'm giving to the people who got the jobs. Okay, which is, again, completely the wrong way to think about it. So, but coming back to the empanelment. So what you're doing is you're getting all of the benefits of the UPSC, but then you're saying being empaneled and makes you eligible for the job it doesn't guarantee you a job right so you still have to show up you still have to be effective you still have to be productive you still have to invest in your skills and it allows departments to kind of have additional requirements for their specific job and because of empaneled 10 times they will be the people with the zoology with the botany with those specific interests who want to then go work in the forest so the people you know with the and who want to anyway and then what happens is because these are three to five year contracts and the renewal is not guaranteed you have the motivation to stay current and keep your skills current and you're eligible for all of the training programs and everything and then you could imagine that you know maybe you have a three-year contract and then a five-year contract and then a seven-year contract and then after 15 years you say okay listen you've done this so well now we absorb you okay like because you still need yeah. certain permits, and you get the same points that you were suggesting in the apprenticeship program right you can have a point system even here but the other difference here is like you know because here this becomes a way of encouraging people to rotate out of government right you do this for three years and five years and say fine i'm going to go to the private sector i'm going to go to civil society i'm going to learn different sets of skills but having done my empanelment and having done this I'm always in the pool of people who can then come back into government so then you built a system of lateral entry that is quality controlled by the UPSC right like you mean and then incentivizes the skills incentivizes you know the experiences creates diversity so again I just feel that this is such low hanging fruit because you know that you can easily hire five in a district you go sit in a district collector's office like I mean they are harried right they've got like 50 departments to handle no analytical capacity. So, you know, you put like three of these kind of people in there to just kind of be able to analyze data and kind of, you know, there is so much low-hanging fruit in terms because Devish Kapoor and Aditya Das Gupta have this very nice paper 
right? Looking at staffing in block development offices and they're all understaffed and the staffing really matters. The the chicken and egg problem today is you're understaffed, but you're fiscally nervous about hiring because you know the moment they come in is the day they stop working. Okay, like I mean, so, so you've got the Woody Allen problem, right? So which is why you have to rethink how you do this. And then if we have time, I'll talk about the Telangana example that showed that this is not just a pipe dream. It is doable. Okay, it is doable. It's doable. And, yeah. and, and I think the sieges part of my story of the past four or five years is the reason we built it was just to kind of prove to ourselves, right? I mean, that these are not just like ivory tower ideas, but these are actually doable in practice, right? So, yeah. And now my favorite part of this whole thing, okay? So I'm obviously coming from this from the judicial side of it. So one of the, when I was looking into the vacancy problem, there are multiple problems, right? One is, of course, the fiscal problem and so on. But the other part is there are a lot of jobs where the budget allocation has been done. That seat has been created or that position has been created. But there is, they they haven't even put a call out. They haven't conducted the exam, right, for that local engineer or the local forest officer and so on. And that vacancy will go unfilled for years on it. So one of the reasons for this, I understood, from what I understand, is entirely judicial, which is if you don't craft the perfect advertisement for the exam, anyone can then challenge the exam saying it wasn't fair, right? So if you say something like, you know, we're looking for forest officers and we want people who have a BSc in uh, botany and zoology. Someone will raise an issue and say, uh, why not a BTEC in botany or zoology? Why didn't you add the BTEC? So, you know, at the level of the advertisement, the entire thing is dead on arrival, right? Then you have at each stage, you know, if you conduct an exam, then people can challenge the exam, the court will hold it up. You have all these problems. And The politician who actually created the job is very keen that someone from their party or caste or region or language actually gets that position, but they can't do it because the moment they do it again, the courts will hold it up. My favorite thing about this pool of people who have been sort of, you know, in some sense vetted and credentialed, right, is that it sort of makes this entire thing bulletproof in that it completely de-risks hiring. No one can be pulled up as a corrupt politician or a corrupt bureaucrat or someone who put out an unfair ad or someone who treated, you know, people who have BTECs poorly as opposed to BSEs or government uh, programs differently from private programs. That problem goes away. So right now we have so much risk and we put on so much accountability with virtually no reward on the people who are doing the hiring. It's a completely thankless job and no one does it. So that's actually my favorite part of this. My second favorite part of this, and now I am being a little bit, you know, tongue in cheek, is I think it will strongly devalue this whole overinvestment in engineering and MBAs. Because what we, the reason that's happening right now is that's another kind of selection process for the private sector, right? For the public sector, the selection process is the UPSC. For the private sector, even if they've learned nothing related to the job you actually want to hire them for, you're doing private equity, but you want an engineer with like an MBA of some kind in marketing or whatever, because you think they're credentialed, they clearly have some skills, they have some endurance, they have some ability to learn, we can train them for the rest of it, right? But if people come with this kind of credentialing and some kind of, you know, real world experience for three to five years, the private sector would actually love to hire people like that, right? These are the people who will be running the district office for a hero cycles or a tire company distribution or ITC distribution, all the things for FMCGs happening at the ground level. So I can imagine like so many other misallocations we have in our economy, which goes away because we start creating a better system of credentialing based on the exams we've already taken, which is not as rigid as the Chinese merit exam system. But you know, this is like, it, this is uh, adapted for Indian conditions, <laughs> you know, sort of made in India, some Indian jugaad for Indian situations, accommodating preferences that Indians already have. So that's actually my favorite part of that. Uh, you cracked according to, I'm a design person. And I, according to me, you've really cracked a nice design problem. Thank you. No, and I think, you know, that's why, that's, you know, I think that's why the book in a way doesn't fit any genre, right? It is because most academic books will not get into this level of practical detail, right? Like, I mean, and if you can have a practical thing, it will not be as grounded in the research. So this is just my way of apologizing for the length, right? Like, I mean, in saying that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's constantly teasing about the length. Actually, I read it really quickly. It's very accessible. Uh, the second time I wanted to read certain chapters carefully because I wanted to go back and forth with the end notes and the book is a 
little heavy and you know my my very very delicate wrists and lack of physical strength was was hampering uh, if you have time for one last question this is a little bit more about you and sort of the met- meta question again i think i'm going to sound a bit cheeky when i say this but I felt this the most when I was reading the education and health chapters because that's where you've done so many field studies randomized control trials and so on. And the sense I got was that for the last 20 years like you know starting with young Karthik in the PhD program till now you're feeling out a really large creature right you're trying to feel out that large creature from multiple angles with multiple different co-authors and some people felt the flaps and thought that's a bird right some people thought it's a mammal but has two tails and you somehow because you're so prolific and have published so many papers you managed to feel all of it out and come to the realization that oh no it's an elephant right the the flaps are not wings the flaps are the ears of the elephant this is not a two-tailed mammal it's got a trunk and and this is actually an elephant so now coming to the elephant in the room sorry for for the pun it it almost seems like after all of this and feeling across every aspect of the failed state you figured out that the development problem is at the state level right and the engineering plumbing fixes that rcts typically suggest whether it is to fix absenteeism or service delivery or you know improving learning outcomes or the million other things that you've done that's not going to solve the problem right finally what you need to do is sort of fix the state and you know the way land pritchard says that you've managed to put together that this is actually the you managed to figure out what is the problem at the ontological level not just the problem at the sort of surface or the or the minor level so one i know i'm being cheeky but is this a good way to think about how you've had your own sort of career progression and how this book has come about and now if if yes how do you think about the micro foundations field studies randomized control you know sort of enterprise now looking back Yeah, so I don't think it's cheeky at all, right? Like, yeah. So I think, the, you, yeah, you've characterized the intellectual journey broadly correctly. I think I've been see where I think I've been very privileged is that I also had exposure to the older ways of doing development. Okay, which is when I was an undergrad, I had taken graduate development, which at that time was being that class itself was called structural transformation and historical perspective. Okay, so I think the problem sometimes with kind of you know the the younger development economics kind of you know PhD is that for economic history. used to be a requirement in phd's has been taken out okay uh, history of political thought or history of economic thought essentially doesn't exist now even at the undergrad level it's gone into like social studies programs right so where i feel very it exists at george mason for the listeners who are listening we have a field at the phd level good for you good for you right um, and again you know i think it is true that those things were taken out in the sense that they were not core to the creating of the modern professional economist whose job is to kind of do go deep into specific areas and write papers okay but i feel uniquely privileged in terms of having had exposure and which is why you will never hear me kind of like you know rant against rcts you will never hear me rant saying but it will it is kind of a very eclectic sense of saying let's take the best out of everything right like i mean and just kind of pull it together and just keep learning and keep Keep learning and keep learning. Okay, so you know the things. I mean, like it's still amazing, right? I mean, it's so easy to criticize RCTs. I think the one thing I will say about RCTs is that I think framing the purpose of an RCT as saying let us find out what works so that we can scale it up, I think, is a mistake. Okay, and I think a lot of the pushback probably comes, and rightly so, from I would say the early framing errors. Okay, like I mean, with saying oh this is going to be about finding out what works, and that's how we're going to advance development. Okay, I think the way I have approached RCTs has always been to saying what does the rct tell me about what the binding constraint is in this particular setting okay so and which is why the way i solve the external validity problem is i'm never trying to say this thing worked here and therefore we should scale it everywhere right so the way i approach the rcts is what is the principle that is being illustrated by this high quality study now the value of the rct and i'll give you kind of the example from perhaps you know the The, the perhaps the most important paper i feel i've written in my 20 years right you know which is the paper on enrega okay where you know where we found that improving enrega implementation not only improved wages but it also in- increased like private sector employment okay and that kind of goes contra to every econ 101 we learn we learn demand curve slope downwards okay now the point is that this then goes back 
to Sherlock Holmes and saying, you know, when the facts change, I change my theory, right? I mean, so the, the value of the RCT is that with the well-designed experiment, you don't question the facts. And then that sometimes make you go back and question the theory, right? Like, I mean, and saying, so what is it? And then you realize that, no, we live in kind of, we are taught the new classical econ 101 in our textbooks, but, you know, under imperfect, imperfect competition, labor market power, like, I mean, things can be different. And that's, you know, what you illustrate. So the value of the RCT, so what I feel, I hope is unique about the book. And again, there's, there's an intellectual kind of timeline, right? There was an era in the early 2000s. It's easy to criticize the credibility revolution, right? But the credibility revolution is coming after an era when People were writing papers like I just ran two million regressions. Okay. Like empirical work had lost all credibility because you could choose, you could get whatever result you wanted by whatever control you chose to put in. Okay. And so, which is why I think the, the field went through this phase of saying, I would rather answer small questions well than big questions badly. Okay. Because what were the big questions? The big questions was growth, right? Growth is the big question, but you had a decade of a cottage industry of cross country growth regressions. I mean, that was essentially garbage. Okay. Like, I mean, so, you know, you, th- that was the two million in regressions, okay? You you could, everything was correlated and so you couldn't say anything. Now, then some things are more robust than others but I think that is the epistemic revolution the field went through which then went through a longer time of better access to microdata, better computers, better computing power and saying let's do. And then the experimental movement can be seen as kind of a part of that wave of saying listen, like you know, let's get credible estimates. Now, I think what, what I think the top people in the field have always been able to do is to then kind of saying let's look at each of these experiments and then let's synthesize size, what is the big picture that's emerging from that, which is never the same as mechanically counting studies, right? And saying, oh, this is what we should do, because th- there's no substitute for judgment, okay? And you do need the judgment. But I think the way I combine the micro and the macro is I feel much more confident saying what I'm saying. I'll give you a simple example. We talk about de- de- decentralization, okay? Now, theoretically, there is a, there's clearly something is too much decentralization, right? Theoretically, there is kind of an optimum amount of, you know, of things that happen centrally in, in a decentralized way. But the beauty now, and this is a paper that's RNR at the AR by Jeff Weaver and Veda Narsimhan, and, you know, but it's not an RCT, but it's beautifully identified micro evidence of the impact of having a smaller polity, okay, using an RCT, uh, using a uh, regression discontinuity. And then that shows that a smaller polity had better outcomes on every way. Right? So then, and because we then see consistent patterns, I had a PhD student and that's a project I'm also working on of just looking at this reform in Andhra Pradesh and in and NT Ramarao, right? Where you went from blocks to mandals, which is one of the most important governance reforms that's not been studied enough, where you been, where a block serves 250,000 people, the mandal serves about 60 to 65,000. And what we find is that on almost every measure of service delivery, because you've got this RD where villages now get closer to the district uh, block headquarters, service delivery improves, right? So, and all of this then builds high quality micro evidence to kind of consistent with this grander theoretical point that we are over centralized, right? So, so therefore, I don't see the contradiction. And I think I said this in a chat with Amit once and, uh, you know, of saying that I hope to take both a bird's eye view and a worm's eye view, right? I mean, that you're both uh, telescoping back to see what this big picture is and then zooming in all the way in on the details. I hope, again, you know, it's every, every I guess, senior scholar's life is their own kind of personal intellectual journey. So I think to the extent that there are younger people listening and seeing like, you know, what to do, you know, there is a sense in which that the daily practice of being a researcher requires you to put your head down like I mean and just kind of do your one particular problem really well and you know there's a phase for that and then there's a phase for kind of you know the big picture and ideally you don't lose that and find a way to balance that and I've just been uniquely lucky in terms of you know so even like you'll see one thing that in this book and I think which is not common to book by economists is I'm unapologetic about having like an ethical frame okay like I mean that shows up in many of the chapters and like you know like I say even those six sectoral chapters I'm doing, which is um, education and skills, health and nutrition, police and public safety, courts and justice, uh, social protection and jobs. So it tells me what you think is the role of the state, basically. That's what I got so out of it. It is true, right? Like, I mean, but it's also there's something deeper than that, right? I mean, which is to say that, see, there are a lot of people like, I mean, who'll say, oh, we should do education health because that's what we need for growth. But the point with these six things is I don't have to choose between the Bhagavati and the Sen views, right? Because they are intrinsically important for human welfare. I care that you're better nourished. I care that you're better skilled, regardless of what it does for productivity. So from a pure ethical perspective, I want to crack that problem. Even because you see, if I say do this because 
it going to contribute to growth? Somebody will come back and say, oh, maybe it's better to invest in higher education for growth. Okay. So there is, there is an ethical core in what I'm doing here that says, no, regardless of what it does for productivity, like, I mean, we need to do this. But the bonus here is it also helps productivity, right? So then when you, I mean, when you look at the, uh, the police chapter, right, being safe is an intrinsic right of a citizen, but it's also going to boost female labor force participation, right? You know, on justice, right? I mean, kind of 70% of people incarcerated are under trial without being found guilty. And so it's a it's, it's a human right to improve the functioning of our court system. But if you look at Manaswini's like beautiful paper, right, mean that, you know, oh, increasing yeah. judicial capacity unlocks kind of block factors of, right? That is a right, fantastic that unlock, blocks paper. factors of production that is also boosting economic productivity, right? So, and this is why... And it's like such a marginal improvement. Like it's not like she's like, you know, increasing the number of judges by like, you know, hundredfold or something. It's but such it a is tiny a increase, but, but the return is big. At the district court level, right? Because it exactly. Each judge it's a matters. huge, so, huge this, improvement. This again goes back to then the micro and the macro. And the purpose of a book like this, right? I mean, is, you know, there are, th- there are thousands of scholars doing a lot of high quality work, but the purpose is to kind of select the right tales of that body of work and make it accessible to a general reader and saying, listen, this is kind of why research matters. And this is how you bring the research together in this big picture to then identify a path forward for the country. And that's why we. I think the endorsement I like the most, I mean, there's lots of lovely endorsements, but I think what Dr. Kilker said was particularly gratifying. He said, you know, I wish people will just do it. Okay, so. No, but you know, okay, so just, I am i don't want to rant about RCTs with you. The, for that, I think you're the wrong person. I like to rant about RCTs with Land Pritchett, my favorite person. And uh, I have two episodes on it, which are fantastic. He's just so insightful about it. But I do want to sort of get into one point with you, which is, Right now, we're not just talking about what is good research or what is worth doing or what is good evidence and rigorous evidence, right? So on that, I completely agree with you. The credibility revolution happened for a reason. There was too much compute. People were publishing garbage. We needed better results, so on and so forth. But I think the point where the disagreement starts kicking in is that there is an entire sort of industrial complex of people who believe that RCTs will get us development in the old school sense of the word. And I think you know the people who don't know that difference and so on. And that is, I think even among the high priests in the movement, I think there has been, see, here is my own take on this, okay? My own take on this is that if you're, if you're trying to move the epistemic center of gravity, okay, of how a field functions, right? So it is somewhere in one corner. You take a position at the opposite extreme, okay? Like, I mean, to try to move this. But now that, like, I mean, the victory has been won in some ways, right? I mean, I do. So here is, I think, where I'm a little more optimistic, okay? Because I think if you look at what's being published in the journals, if you look at kind of the top job market candidates, a simple RCT doesn't get you a top job anymore. A simple RCT doesn't even get you like a good, you know, doesn't even get you into the ER unless you're now getting into mechanisms unless you're getting into so you know or embedding that in models that then gets you to think more about you know which aspect because yeah so there's an there was a relatively narrow window in economics where you could publish well just by saying i have an rct okay i think in a way credible identification is now table stakes okay so we so we moved the bar right and i think again the RCT movement, yes, it gets criticized for a variety of reasons, but sometimes I think we underappreciate how much it's delivered for better scientific process. Okay. So even like pre-registration of trials, or if you look at p-hacking, okay, if you look at the studies of p-hacking, what they consistently show is that RCTs have a lot less p-hacking. Yes. So again, on this, we don't disagree. I think they've made certain kinds of academic studies better. They've brought in particular kinds of rigor. They templatize things. There's pre-registration. On all of those things, I agree with you. The trouble is, and this is especially the trouble downstream, that the idea of what is development economics became quite synonymous with RCTs. Whereas my sense is, if a young person came to ask you today, hey, what should I study? I deeply care about development. My sense is you're going to tell them, look at public service delivery, look at how we staff state capacity, look at personnel, look at fiscal federalism, look at why don't we have a property tax regime, look at... My sense is the development questions sort of never get 
picked up and answered because those questions can't be answered right it's like a fiscal federalism discussion right you don't go into it because you don't have credible evidence so that just gets left on the table and it's almost as if downstream people think especially very young impressionable students think that oh that must not matter for development or that's not development economics that's some kind of political science or something else the reason i'm less concerned okay so if you look at the program of bread okay which was the apex development economics conference that we just hosted here at ucsd this past weekend okay i mean yes there are a bunch of rc but there was almost no paper okay that i saw that was being presented as saying here is an rct of what works okay so the rcts were being presented as saying here is how here, so i'll give you a simple example right there was this very very nice paper about targeting lpg subsidies okay and and the subtle point here was that you want to kind of subsidize the adoption among the poor okay whereas the right now the subsidy is the same regardless of the cylinder size okay and the simple point is because the poor have a higher opportunity the cost of time the rich are willing to kind of like you know so you can sub- you can target the subsidy better by subsidizing kind of like the smaller cylinder okay so at one level it feels small bore but it is actually quite central to like i mean discussions of climate adaptation discussions of you know allocating budgets for- so i so and even with say it's property taxes right i mean see the good news is that what i think see what i keep telling my students and i think many people do most people do now is that the question comes before the method okay i mean so the so, so i don't think it's correct to say that development means our cities though a lot of people do have that mistaken impression partly perhaps because that's where you know the pipeline of ras comes from and you know so but one way to think about it is that getting that ra experience is now a way of getting field experience okay of la- just going to the field and understanding what the ground reality is it doesn't mean you have to do an rct okay but on the other hand i think the the way the framing has changed right I means so i'm just thinking about there was a wonderful paper on female labor force participation okay it was an rct but the nice thing is that so there are so many important micro questions that are perfectly amenable to rcts right so if i'm looking at what happens if i give an opportunity to work out of home like i'm hean to women and what does that do that is an individually randomizable question okay now if you come back and say that but on the other hand why am i optimistic is that macro development is also doing well okay so macro development is has always been about building these broader general equilibrium models and so and we are starting to see now more discipline in these macro models that is informed by well identified micro estimates so the good news is i feel that the market in journals see the standards keep going up okay and so there is enough of a market test here to say that okay like i mean just the plain old vanilla rct doesn't get you there okay so i think yes there are other problems with rct so personally i would say the bigger problem with our cities right now is that it's not about the method it's about the fact that because data collection for individual our cities is expensive right like i mean if i was a public funder of research i would fund high quality administrative data sets high quality general purpose thing because that would kind of lower the entry barriers to like i mean hundreds of phd students like you know to come work on important topics and also lots of comparative studies india is a laboratory because it's federal lots of different states ward see where i think the misallocation is happening is not in terms of are we crowding out important questions because that there's enough of a market test you see so the, i mean the referees you know how difficult it is to please referees and referees are no longer happy just with having an rct okay so that i'm not worried about but on the cost side i mean i think you know there were so but again the people who have been who've seen this kind of enterprise we are all aware of this right i mean and jpal themselves was actually investing in kind of this administrative data initiative whereby there would be attempts to kind of you know improve the quality of admin data that could then be made available both to lower the marginal cost of our cities and reduce the barriers to doing work okay so i do think again, lots of improvements are possible but at least for young students or people thinking about development at least for me development is not our cities and if you look at the bread program like i mean you'll see that there's a whole bunch of exciting papers being presented that are not our cities okay but that being said if the question you're working on is something that is amenable to modular interventions right i mean then the rct is going to be more credible than kind of arguing your way out of kind of saying oh you know let so i mean and the number of shoddy studies as you'll see about let's look at what happens to women who work inside or outside the house without you know the the 2000 confounding fa- variables there will be okay so that's the kind of place where you want to see okay if i offer you the opportunity to work out of home like what does that do the rct buys you a lot in terms of methodological credibility 
already. And there, I think it's not crowding out a big question. Okay, so yeah, so, so that's how I think. Yeah, and I think here, I guess the, the big worry I have is not that, you know, a simple garden variety RCT gets published in a top journal. Like I couldn't be bothered about that, that problem at all. I've checked out of that system. My bigger concern is the misallocation of talent that a lot of people come in wanting to work on big development questions and the way our PhDs are designed is you have to sort of specialize. They end up specializing in a method. They end up sinking a lot of time in one or two field studies that kind of take six, seven years to get published. And then this is sort of the thing that you do. And there are very few people who are able to, you know, switch out of it or make the sort of transitions that you've made. But my philosophical issue with the whole thing is... I have a fundamental problem with the idea that we should only pursue those sorts of policies for which we have gold standard evidence. As if common sense is dead, as if experimentation is dead, as if we created the Indian constitutions through RCTs, as if we threw our geographical boundaries and our election commission through RCT. So, you know, that's sort of my metaphilosophical problem with it, that I do deeply appreciate as an economist how much you focus on rigorous studies. You don't pick up garbage. You're so careful in parsing out every sentence, every claim made in the book. So I really appreciate that. But I also sort of grieve a lot of the good common sense ideas that I know that you're fundamentally backing that are not in the book that I think would make the book even better, though it would make it longer, but I would think it would make it even better. No, so I think, listen, you know, I think the good news is this, right? So, Okay, let's think about the difference between an academic economist and a policy economist, right? I mean, so I think the same economist, like, you know, and it'll be interesting. At some point, you should talk to Dean Carlin, okay? And saying, you know, here was Dean, like, you know, one of the leading lights of the RCT movement. And how did he function differently when he's now the chief economist of USAID? Or talk to Rachel, like, you know, when she was kind of the executive director of JPAL, like, you know, a leading light of the RCT movement. And then was chief economist at FCDO, and she's now just become president of the Center for Global Development, okay? So I think basically what happens here is that that the way you function is a function of what your core job is, okay? So as an academic, your job is to kind of create high quality pieces of knowledge and not necessarily worry too much about what the policy decision is. It is, whereas when you're the policy economist, your job is to say that I'm going to synthesize the best that there is out there and make the best decision. And you're right. So many times, it's not like the world is waiting on RCT evidence for decisions, okay? So, and yeah, so maybe like, you know, what we need is better training for policy economists. Like I mean to say, how do you, you know, use and, and maybe the book that way hopefully serves that purpose by focusing a lot on principles that will apply to, you know, any person in a policy role saying, okay, here are principles that I should constantly be thinking about, right? I mean, in the context of like the, the two by two, right? So I'm not obviously going to, there's gazillions of public finance expenditure items that I'm not covering, but that's a framework that can now be used in any government finance department saying, okay, when I'm getting a budget proposal, can I even start thinking about these issues of economic incidence of the expenditure or spatial incidence, right? So none of this is RCTs. That's coming from my background in public finance. So I think the book in a way represents this broader synthesis. But again, I'm less worried, frankly, right? Because, you know, but the reason I talk about what's being published in top journals is because that speaks to the pipeline of young talent. But I also think that there are increasing vehicles for people to move into policy roles, right? I mean, variety of fellowships where what you need is not to be a producer of knowledge, but a high quality synthesizer and absorber of knowledge with the kind of caveats of knowing what does it buy you and what doesn't it buy you. So I agree. Every method, every methodology has its flaws. And I'll be the first person and I've written openly about limitations of our cities, right? So the, 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 the art of doing good economics is knowing what method works for what problem and to always put the problem first, okay? And ask the big questions, not be scared of asking the big but, ambitious but think, questions. You know, but in a way, what I'm doing with the book is saying my primary identity is a micro development economist, right? So because the questions I have focused on, like education and health, are amenable to modular implementation and variation, those are questions that are well suited to RCTs, okay? But when I'm writing a book like this, I mean, I'm clearly, in fact, I think Junaid, one of the endorsements says that, you know, that I draw well beyond the world of RCTs and that's 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 what the book is about. Yeah, no, this was a pleasure to read. You have to promise to come back and talk about so many other things that we both are interested in, including the work that Sejus is doing. How do we think about improving, you know, nuts and bolts state capacity at the state level and so on. But this was such a pleasure. I'm so happy uh, that you did this. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I've always been a fan of the podcast. In fact, I don't you know if you saw, I mean, in addition to... Uh, yes, you mentioned it in the acknowledgements. I was so there thrilled. Is, there, is, there is a... And, you know, I...
I got some serious cred because people took screenshots, listeners took screenshots and sent us that you actually mentioned us in the acknowledgements, which we were very thrilled about. I'm so glad about that. Yeah, no, you guys are doing great work and, you know, and yeah, I think the the broader project of, you know, creating knowledge and transmitting that knowledge and then acting on that knowledge is essentially how most human progress has happened. And, you know, that's, that's why we do what we do. Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S. Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.